Hi everyone, so today we're going to look at a couple of very interesting results and we're going to look at them through a problem. And this has got to do with the cyclic permutation in polynomial. So I'm going to tell you what that is. But you know, the things that we're going to discuss today are very fundamental to polynomials in algebra. And in fact, in many modern day problems, these results are used directly without improving them. So I think it, uh, it, it worth a good discussion on these two important results. So um, without wasting any time, let's just get right into it. This is the problem number one from the USAMO exam in 1974. And in this video, we're going to talk about the cyclic permutation polynomials. We're going to talk about a couple of interesting results. We're going to prove them as well. Then we have certain book sessions of senior math Olympiads. And at the end, we have a similar but challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so what's it telling us? It's telling us that let A, B, and C denote three distinct positive integers, or three distinct integers in general, and let P denote a polynomial having integer coefficients, show that it is impossible to have p of a is equal to b, p of b is equal to c, and p of c is equal to a. So there's a pretty cool cyclic structure being formed over here if you see. So a cyclic permutation, p of a is equal to b, p of b is equal to c, and p of c is equal to a. They're telling you this is impossible such that p of x is a polynomial having integer coefficient. Or in other words, p of x belongs to z, a joint of x. This notation essentially means that p of x is integer coefficients, right? And uh, before we jump right into this, I'm going to introduce to you to a lemma or an interesting result that you should know. And it's a very famous result regarding polynomials in general. And this just states that if a polynomial P of X has integer coefficients, then A minus B would divide P of A minus P of B for all integers A comma B, for all A comma B belong to integers, right? And uh, let's just discuss the proof of this. It's quite fascinating and it's quite elementary. But like I said, these two results, this and the problem uh, that we're going to prove, that we're going to solve, are actually two very basic, very elementary results in algebra. And you should be knowing about them because they're used directly in many modern day problems, like I said. Okay, so let's just discuss the proof. So let's say we have the polynomial P of X is equal to K0 plus K1X plus k to x square and then you go all the way up to k n x is per n right or in other words i can just use the sigma notation and i can write that as k i times x is per i as i goes from 0 to n so it's essentially the same thing i'm using the sigma notation just to simplify the writing work okay great so what would p of a minus p of b be well it's pretty simple this would be summation from i is equal to 1 to n of k i times a raised to the power i minus b raised to the power i. And if you notice something, over here we have index from i is equal to zero, but over here I have taken the index from i is equal to one. And really the reason for that is i is equal to zero corresponds to the constant term. Now the constant term, which is k naught, it would be the same in p and p b, and when you subtract them, you'd get zero. Or you can see it over here as well, just plug in i is equal to zero, you get a raised to the power zero minus b raised to the power zero, one minus one is equal to zero. So no matter how you see it, the constant term is being zero, right? So I can just index it from i is equal to one. Okay, great. Now there actually exists a very cool factorization of a raised per i minus b raised per i. And if you study a little bit of binomial theorem or factorization, you would realize that this can be factorized as a minus b times a raised per i minus one plus a raised per i minus two b. And this goes obviously all the way up to b raised per i minus one, okay? Now, if I just plug that factorization into our original result, I'll get P of A minus P of B is the summation from I is equal to 1 till N of Ki times A minus B times this entire thing, right? A is for I minus 1 plus A is for I minus 2B and you go all the way up to B is for I minus 1. Now, if you notice something, this A minus B is a constant, right? It is not depending upon any value of i. i is just not a parameter for it. a and b are constant, so it's very clear that a minus b is a constant. So a minus b can effectively be taken out of the summation. But once you do that, you'll see that you have p of a minus p of b on the left hand side, and a minus b is effectively acting as a factor or a divisor of the p of a minus p of b. But what does that mean? That means that a minus b would effectively divide p of a minus p of b 
for all a comma b that are integers right all integers a comma b and that's it right we have proved the result so just keep that in mind just keep that in mind this is a very important result and we're going to use that extensively in order to prove our original problem right so with that lemma being proved let's move on to a problem so in the problem they're telling us that prove that it is impossible to have this cyclic structure p of a is equal to b p of b is equal to c and p of c is equal to a so they're asking us in a polynomial with integer coefficients right in a polynomial integer coefficient prove that this case is impossible like it can never ever ever happen this is what we need to prove now for the sake of contradiction assume that it can happen right assume that it can happen and we're obviously going to use contradiction we're going to prove that um, this is a false assumption via certain contradiction and then we're going to say that okay that this can never happen so that's just going to be a rough flow chart of it okay so for the sake of contradiction, like I said, we're assuming that it can happen. This case can happen. This cyclic permutation polynomials is possible. Okay. But then we know that A minus B divides P of A minus P of B from the lemma that I just proved above. But they've given to me in the problem that P of A is B and P of B is equal to C. So effectively, A minus B divides B minus C. Let me just call that as equation number one. Now, we also know that B minus C would divide P of B minus P of C. Basically, the lemma that I told you above. But P of B is effectively C and P of C is effectively A. So from here, we can say that B minus C would divide C minus A, result number 2. Okay. And we also know that C minus A would divide P of C minus P of A. But well, like again, P of C is given to be A and P of A is given to be B. So C minus A divides A minus B. That is my equation number 3. So really what we've done is we've resolved this problem resolve this weird looking problem into a series of three results a series of three divisibility results and what are they they are a minus b divides b minus c then you have b minus c divides c minus a and then you have c minus a divides a minus b so again a sort of a cyclic order is being formed just now with divisibility earlier we had a cyclic permutation of polynomials now we have a cyclic permutation of this divisibility so now let's talk a little bit about this divisibility and how we can proceed so whenever I say that any natural number k divides another natural number n, I can essentially say that k is less than or equal to n. But if you remember, in this problem, we are dealing with integers, right? And when you're dealing with integers, you kind of need to, con kind of need to take into the case where negatives as well. So if you're dealing with integers, you need to take the modulus of sign, right? So modulus of k is less than or equal to modulus of n. Or in our case, from equation number one, I can essentially write modulus of a minus b is less than or equal to modulus of b minus c from equation number two i can write that modulus of b minus c is less than or equal to modulus of c minus a and from equation number three i can write the modulus of c minus a is less than or equal to modulus of a minus b but do you notice something over here the lower bounds and the upper bounds are the same well what does that mean that means the modulus of a minus b is equal to the modulus of b minus c is equal to modulus of c minus a and that's something which is very fascinating okay now now it's actually very simple from here on it's just a matter of computation and simplification so i'm going to take any two of these let's say this and this and i'm going to say that modulus of a minus b is equal to modulus of c minus a that's very clear and what i'm going to do is i'm going to square them because what happens when you square them is that the modulus gets removed you can square them normally right so this just becomes a squared plus b squared minus 2ab is equal to a squared plus c squared minus 2. So you square the modulus gets removed, right? And I can just simplify this, you know, a squared, a squared gets cancelled. So b squared minus c squared plus 2ac minus 2ab is equal to 0. So I'll get b plus c times b minus c minus 2a times b minus c is equal to 0. Just trying to factorize this, you know. I can take b minus c common and I'll get b plus c minus 2a is equal to 0. So we have really two cases, right? When b minus c is equal to 0 and when this other thing is equal to 0. But if you actually notice, A, B, and C were distinct. Just to remind you, A, B, and C were distinct. I'll just show it to you as well. Where did it go? A, B, and C denote three distinct integers. What does that mean? A cannot be equal to B, which cannot be equal to C. All three are unique. All three are distinct. They cannot be the same. If they cannot be the same, B minus C can never be zero, right? Because then B cannot be equal to C. And if B cannot be equal to C, B minus C can never be zero, which essentially implies that B plus C has to be equal to 2A or b, minus c, b plus c minus 2 is equal to 0, right? Let me call that as equation number 4. 
Now again, similarly, you can take uh, any any two equations. Where did it go? Any two equations from here. I'll take number two and number three. So basically, you have modulus of b minus c is equal to modulus of c minus a. And I can just really square these terms. So we'll get b squared plus c squared minus two bc is equal to c squared plus a squared minus two ac. You cancel these terms. And just try to simplify this so a square minus b square plus 2bc minus 2ac is equal to zero so a plus b times a minus b minus 2c a minus b is equal to zero what does that mean factorize a minus b you'll get a plus b minus 2c is equal to zero now using a similar argument a minus b can never be zero because they need to be distinct a not equal to b so that implies that a plus b is equal to 2c and then we have equation number five so again, we've reduced down that divisibility condition to two normal conditions, you know, to rather standard equation-like conditions. And what are they? We had B plus C is equal to 2A, which was equation number four. And then we had A plus B is equal to 2C, which was equation number five. Now it's very easy to kind of simplify this. I'll just subtract both equations, equation four minus equation number five. I'll get C minus A is equal to 2A minus 2C. And just simplifying this c plus 2c is 2a plus a so i'll get 3c is equal to 3a divided by 3 and you will get a is equal to c or c is equal to a but that's a contradiction it's a very clear contradiction right a b and c are distinct right they can never be equal to one another so if you see no matter what case we are considering we're always getting contradiction there it is always telling us that it needs to be equal a needs to be equal to C, which is a contradiction. But what are we contradicting over here? Right? What are we contradicting? Well, we are contradicting our original statement, right? For the sake of contradiction, assume that it can happen. This is what we are contradicting. Right? So we are contradicting the fact that this cyclic structure, the cyclic uh, the cyclic permutation can exist. But since it's a contradiction, our assumption is false. And therefore, this cyclic permutation P of A is equal to B, P of B is equal to C. And P of C is equal to A can never, ever, ever, never happen in a in an integer polynomial, right? This can never, ever, ever happen, right? And that is the result that we had to prove. So just keep this in mind. So whenever you, in a way, see such a cyclic structure in any polynomial algebra problem, just keep in mind that it's a contradiction. Right? It can never happen. This is a very important result. And many times it's used directly in polynomial equations, in functional equations, in a lot of general problems of polynomials, right? In algebra especially. So this, these are a couple of results that you should know, right? A minus B divides P of A minus P of B. And the other is the cyclic result of uh, permutations with polynomials that we have just proven, right? So that was quite an interesting discussion, I hope, and hope you learned something from it. Okay, so we have some book sessions for senior math Olympiads. I'm a compendium, polynomials by Barbeo, elementary number theory by Siapinski, graph theory by Harari, combinatorics by Brualdi, secrets and inequalities, and functional equations and how to solve them by Christopher G. Spall. Okay, so at the end we have a similar level charging problem and um, they have given us two polynomials, P and Q, three variables, and both P and Q are cyclic polynomials. It's pretty clear to see these are both cyclic uh, polynomials, right? Then prove that P plus Q is also cyclic. So basically they've given us a polynomial P, they've given us a polynomial Q, they've defined it, X plus Y plus Z and X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared respectively. And then prove effectively that P plus Q is also cyclic polynomial. P is cyclic, Q is cyclic, prove that P plus Q is cyclic. Right, as simple as that. So we'll try this out and if you're able to do it, let me know. Until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Chinta programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States, and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR, and IISC. For more information, visit chinta.com.